Good afternoon, everybody, and happy International Women's Day. It's really fantastic to see you guys loading into the conversation. I see the chat already coming to life. Um, it's great to have you here with us for this special event uh, brought to you by Smith School of Business at Queen's University. My name is Meredith Dalt, and I'm a business journalist at Smith School of Business at Queen's, and I'm going to be your host and your moderator for today's discussion. And I know this is going to be a really great one, Redefining Success, Women Work and Finding Balance. So thanks again for being with us today. And as always, today's webinar is presented by Smith Business Insight and by Queen's Executive Education. I want to start by acknowledging that Queen's is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories, and we are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. Next, before I introduce our panel, a few bits of housekeeping, as always. So the first thing is that yes, yes, indeed, this conversation is going to be recorded just by being signed up today. You're going to be getting a link to that recording and I urge you to share the recording with your network. Feel free to, to send it far and wide because um, I know there'll be lots of insights you want to share today. So thanks for that. If you want to ask a question and I strongly encourage you to do that, you'll notice two buttons at the bottom of your screen. Please only use the Q&A button if you want to direct a question to our panel. I expect, as you can already see, the chat is going to be pretty lively. So don't put your questions there because we may not see them. Make sure the questions go right into the Q&A. Uh, right into the Q&A button, at the Q&A button. Um, so yeah, but as I say, chat, go wild. <laughs> it's your space, and I hope that you will use it to engage today. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our panel, and it is a fantastic one. We're very uh, lucky to have these three panelists with us today. I want to start by introducing Jill Nicolation, who is an award-winning business leader. Uh, she has 30 years of experience shaping some of the world's most powerful brands, spanning consumer products, food and beverage, technology, financial, automotive, and alcoholic beverages, among others. As the founder and former CEO of agency Juniper Park, TBWA, she was named one of the three most powerful CEOs, uh, most powerful female CEOs by WXN and a mad woman of Canada by the Globe and Mail, which is a special honor, I think. Um, all this while her team earned hundreds of awards globally. Jill now applies her love for human insight as an executive coach, and she coaches one-on-one, -on -one, facilitates CEO workshops for WPO Global, and is an advisor to the Modern Elder Academy, which I hope we'll hear about more in a short time. Lulu Liang has more than a decade of experience in scaling companies. She is the co-founder of Evergreen Journals, the creator of The Habit Journal, a tool designed to, positive, to foster positive and lasting habits. Previously, Lulu was the CEO of Girl Boss, a modern media company empowering ambitious women, boasting an audience of over two and a half million followers. Before Girl Boss, she was CEO of Luxie Hair, a global beauty brand. Lulu's achievements have earned her multiple awards. Forbes named her one of the top 30 most notable individuals under the age of 30 in North American retail and e-commerce, which is no small feat. Uh, Lulu is a sought-after speaker, coach, board member, advisor, and consultant. Welcome, Lulu. And finally, Tanya Van Beeson is president and CEO of WCM. Before joining WCM, Tanya led the Canadian board and CEO practice of a global human capital firm, where she advised corporate, uh, <laughs> corporate clients on their most important leadership decisions. Previously, Tanya led member engagement and operations at Catalyst, a global nonprofit focused on the advancement of women and other underrepresented groups in the workplace. A passionate advocate for gender equity as a driver of economic growth and progress, Tanya is a sought-after speaker, thought leader, and architect of change. She's contributed to several research studies analyzing leadership trends and is a frequent contributor to news media on women's advancement, leadership, and workplace equality. Thank you, you three, for being here today. Are you all unmuted? This is where I get to invite you to, to do that. Say our hellos. Welcome, everybody. Hey, Meredith. Hello. Thank you. Hello. So excited um, to be here. It's, it really, we're so excited to have you here. And and hello, audience. Look at you guys going wild in the chat. So so thank you for your engagement already. Um, our focus today is on redefining sec success and on finding balance. And by that, I mean not only that we're going to be making space to reconsider the very notion of its success, but we're going to talk about the quest for work-life balance, something I know that all of you have spent time thinking about. But I wanted to start by asking each of you in turn about how the idea of success has factored into your own life. And it kind of gives us a sense of sort of who you are and what your background is. Jill, I want to start with you. In 2021, as we, as I said in the intro, WXN named you as one of the three most powerful female CEOs in Canada. And then shortly after that, you stepped away from the company you'd founded to become an executive coach. So can you tell us about deciding to make that pivot? 
and where that kind of lines with your ideas of success? Yeah, it that award well, it's a team award. It wasn't just for me because none of us have achieve anything without an incredible team but it was it was a really meaningful award because it was a wonderful summation to that chapter and I knew that chapter was coming to an end something I say often either to my clients even to my staff when I was at the agency is notice what's ending and let it often we think everything has to go forever and it doesn't relationships don't jobs don't and when we resist that sometimes we stay too long but this chapter was coming to a close. And so that, that award was beautiful, but it was coming at the end of a 30 year chapter of which little sub chapters were in there. And it was time, it was absolutely time to, to go to close that and then start uh, into my next chapter, which was taking my love of human insight, which is what made me a great marketer at Kraft Foods, which made me a great agency uh, for clients around the world. And now I do that with executives, but it's the same, it's the same skill. I'm just applying it differently, but that chapter closed. Um, yeah. And so how does your, how does your practice work now? I mean, you're, how are you working with people? They're coming to you and saying, I'm already a, a CEO. I'm really proud of the work I'm doing, but I want a little, a eh, little something. Yeah. Well, I've had a coach for nine years, transformative for my career. Um, I mean, every two weeks for nine years and just to get self-reflective. Who am I? How do I show up? What are my patterns? How can I be better? Where are my blind spots? And so because I'm so grateful for the work I've had with him, I was like, oh, I think this is one of the places I can take human insight next and I can give that gift forward. So I work with clients one-on-one all around the world. Um, and I also work with executive teams through YPO, which is Young President's Organization. I just came back from Baja doing a a CEO workshop there on the subject of happiness, Arthur Brooks' work on happiness. We did a 10 hour class. Oh. Um, so those are the ways. And then I also am an advisor to Modern Elder Academy, which is another way of getting human growth. And we can talk about that later. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that background. Lulu, I want to shift mm -hmm. to you. Um, you're taking right now a self imposed sabbatical year after a very busy decade during which you led two different companies as the CEO. Um, what have you learned in the last 10 years and how did you know it was time for a break and where does that factor in with your idea of success, your own success so far? Yeah, that's a big question. What I've learned in the last decade, uh, but definitely in the last decade for me has been the most transformative of my life. And it's taught me a lot. Um, there is a book called the defining decade, um, by Meg J and it talks about why your twenties are the most, impact, why your twenties matter and how to make the most of them. It's a really good book. It's universal uh, for any age group, but especially if you're in your 20s and part of the seminar, I recommend, I think it's a worthwhile read for sure. Um, but for me personally, the key lesson I think in my 20s is to follow your gut and follow your intuition. I think sometimes like when we make decisions, sometimes I've made decisions from ego and not from intuition. And the best decisions I've ever made in my life have all been through intuition and maybe something that like, does it make sense from my ego perspective? Um, for example, when I um, I was a, a, a management consultant when I left um, Smith, uh, I left Queen's Commerce, and uh, it was a very prestigious job, and I left that to become the assistant of a really small company with two employees. But So it wasn't like an ego thing, but it just felt right for me. It was for sure the right thing right in my intuition. That was by far the best decision I've ever made for my career. Like It completely transformed my career. So that um, and, was the, that was that was you stepping in to work with Lexi Hair to clar to clarify. Yes, that okay. was. Yeah. So just to, you didn't step into the CEO role. CEO role. No, I was an assistant. I, I left my management consulting job. My official title was operations assistant, and then I got promoted as CEO um, within the first I think like two and a half years while I was there. Um, but yeah, how did I know it was a break? It's time for a break. Um, taking this one year sabbatical, I feel so lucky to be on this right now. I'm having so much fun. I and mean, it's always been a big dream of mine. Um, a year to travel and to work on personal goals and just have space to think, like time and space to think. So, like, we usually go like back to back to back, and there's no space to like reflect and think. Um, but yeah, it's been wonderful. And I knew it was time. I would say there's three things. One, I knew it was always been like a, a goal of mine and a dream of mine and having the funds saved up for it so that I can take this um, year off. 
Um, two, um, the company that my husband was part of also went through an exit and he was available. So it was nice for us to go on this sabbatical together. It's been really lovely. Um, and then three, honestly, like very transparently, I was really burnt out. Um, and I just needed a break to like get re-inspired and re-centered. And then uh, so grateful for this opportunity. I'm really happy with my decision. It's been really incredible. It's been a really transformative seven months so far. And I think we should all incorporate some form of rest into our lives. Um, yeah. That's great. So in terms of success, I mean, you, you've you done amazing things. And then, you, I mean, to be f- fair for the audience, you're talking about being in your 20s. And the title of the book is The Defining Decade. Lots of people ask yeah. me, Defining Decade. You're you barely into your thirties. I know. I'm not, I'm so we're clear. Not a nice person to say which decade was the best. I have zero to ten, ten to twenty, and, and twenty to thirty. So <laughs> You've twenty and thirty better. have been the most. The twenties have been so good well. for you. Yeah. Um, we're having a little bit of a, a comment from the audience about you being a little bit echoey and hard to understand. So I don't know if you want to mute yourself okay. and, and we can sort of do, um sort of. Uh, mute some of that echo. I'm not sure if you can, but I, I'm just letting you know the audience, some of the audience are, are having a little bit of trouble. Okay. Here. But while you do that, I'm going to shift over to Tanya. Um, Tanya, you recently stepped into the CEO role with WCM. And, okay. uh, and I let sort of people understand, maybe you can tell us a bit about what WCM, but you have tons of leadership experience, including serving as an executive director at Catalyst. Was any of this part of your plan when you're setting out in your career and thinking, I am going to be successful, here I go? How did that, How did this all come about for you? Yeah, so let me just touch on the WCM yeah. question. So WCM is a Canadian not-for-profit that is entirely focused on advancing women in the finance sector. So really our vision is to achieve gender equity in the finance sector in Canada. Uh, and that we do that through advocacy, through programming, through professional development, all kinds of great stuff. So I would encourage you to check us out. Um, your question about my vision of success early on, Meredith, completely different from where I am now. Uh, and I wouldn't change anything. So um, the completely different part was I started my post undergrad at, at Smith, then still called Queens. Um, I went to PNG. And I started PNG, and within the first few years, I was sure I was going to go to Cincinnati. I was going to run the company, and that was all going to be a very obvious path for me. And then about year five, I thought, I'm not sure if I care about another pair of diapers or another tube of toothpaste, although I do admit that I'm still a faithful Crest toothpaste user. <laughs> um, and then I left, I left package goods and I went into executive search and that is not an obvious path, but my parents had a small search firm. So I had sort of grown up at the kitchen table, understanding that business. I spent 21 years in that business and uh, I led the fi- co-led the financial services practice. So that's how I kind of became familiar with financial services. But then I also stood up a diversity practice when I was at Spencer Stewart, which very transparently at the time was putting white women on boards. So it's not, it was not representative of diversity uh, as we understand it today. It was, you know, it was, you could argue regressive at the time, but that's where we were. That's where we were. Uh, I then in 2016, I will tell you, I had a, um, I probably should have gone to see Jill because I had a professional um, midlife crisis, truly. And I had lost the passion for the work that I was doing, not for the people and the firm, but just for the nature of the work. But I was really passionate about advancing women in the workplace. And I had this opportunity to go to Catalyst, which was a wonderful organization. I spent six years there in a domestic role and then a global role. And then I popped back out. Again, I probably should have gone to see Jill um, (laughs) because I thought I would fall back in love with my uh, professional services. And so I popped back out and I joined a great firm and I had a great opportunity again to advance women in leadership because I led the board and CEO practice. But actually what I realized was that my passion was doing this work. So I came back into not-for-profit. And so the path actually was not at all linear. It was not at all what I expected. When I graduated from Smith, I did not expect that I would go into the not-for-profit sector. And I've now twice been in the not-for-profit sector. And actually the thing that maybe might resonate for not everyone on the call, but certainly for some who are earlier in career and are very motivated um, 
particularly financially, which I think we can be early in our career, both out of necessity and, and desire. And I think all of that is very legitimate. Um, when I, the first time I moved into not-for-profit, I took a 10 times haircut in compensation. And um, those are decisions that I hadn't expected to make at one time. And I will map back to what I said at the beginning. I have zero regrets in terms of my decisions, but I never could have painted from here to there when I first started. Out. Right. But did you, so, so where did the notion of success for you come in? Were there any dark nights of the soul when you were like, but wait, success means X and I'm doing Y. Any moments where you just thought, oh, oh, have I, have I lost the path or, or did the path always feel like the right path? Like to speak to Lulu's intuitive sense, you just knew you were doing the right thing. Um, I would, I'm sure all of us have a few moments here and there where we pause and think, gee, is this the right direction or is that the right direction? Uh, and now I have the benefit of some hindsight, of course. Uh, nothing, nothing that would, there, there was nothing in there that was so difficult that, that I really um, struggled with, with the exception of my, um, my last pop back into for-profit, I did actually have a real gut check moment there where I felt like what I was best at and what I was designed to do was not in alignment with what I was doing. So I think Lulu's bang on. I think, I think the ego thing I actually ha did have to put aside and really lean on my gut and my gut let me, led me to the right place. Well, fantastic. Um, because one of the things that we often, what often happens is I think maybe not just for women, maybe for everybody is the idea that, that we're chasing someone else's idea of success. And I don't know. I mean, why do we think that happens? Um, Jill in, in our promo video, and you talked about this earlier, you talked about the idea of these, of a success script and how we can kind of become beholden to these things that maybe aren't ours. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about what you mean by success script? Sure. A success script is that name we have in our head that says what does success look like to me and all of us have one and I think for me a couple of things I want to point out is one they change over time and we have to get still in our minds and go what is my success script for who I am now and that's the question I keep asking everyone we should always keep asking male female who am I who am I and who am I now because we do always evolve. Some of us are on growth trajectories, but we're always evolving. And a success script first, we get introduced to it in our childhood homes. We learn very quickly, what does success look like in this home? Or it's imprinted on us, what does success look like in the way your parents described? Well, you know, you in my house, it was like family is everything. And you will, I have three brothers, everyone's at Queens, graduate of something. Um, but we, I was taught all early, that, you know, education is really important. Family above all else. I was a female in a male house. And so while I had lots of opportunities, there's still that, well, there's boys work and there's girls work. And, and you don't realize these things get imprinted upon you. Then you go off to university and then you have more things and you get to, you know, Queens is very competitive and you start to think, oh, I've got to get the most money or the, the best job. And we all of a sudden we start this competition of, Who's got what? Then in your 30s or late 20s, you may have a relationship you're committing to. What does that success group look like? What does being a good parent, what's that success group look like? Now we're jumping into our careers and both Lulu and Tanya have talked about all of a sudden like you're, you're in this race of climbing a ladder. And all three of us have like at some point said, I think, I think this ladder has reached its top for me. And if I climb any further, to use Tanya's words, I will be out of alignment with myself. But how often do some of us like, get on ladders and you're climbing up this ladder and you're like, why am I on this? Your inner voice is saying, I'm not, you're on the wrong ladder. You, you, you're looking at something else. But one, the trick is when you get up high in these ladders, or you're you've committed so much to this ladder, to Lulu's point, your ego can go, well, you can't get off now can't get off now you've put all this time into it what are people going to think or even like you know getting divorced I didn't know anybody who was divorced it was very hard 
I had no, and I had a lot of shame around that. So I sat on that for many years, knowing I'll eventually do it, but I needed the courage because I didn't have a success script right. for what does it successful look like. People were married, right? Yeah. Successful people are married and successful yeah. people have it all going on and successful people climb ladders and successful people become CEOs. So here I am at Kraft going, I have much like you, Tanya, like, I don't want to be the CEO of Kraft, but every single path in Kraft Foods, North America was about becoming an exec to be. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I like mm -hmm. consumer insight. So leaving to go into agency world, I had, I had this, the senior vice president of strategy pull me aside and said, for a very smart girl, you make very dumb career decisions. Oh, no. <laughs> I, literally, that was said to me. I was called girl. I was, in, it was 32. Um, and, and so that's a lot of pressure to go. But in my bones, I know I'm supposed to go down the continuum of marketing from marketer to brand builder. But that took a lot of courage. And there was very few people that said, brilliant idea. Even when I left in April of last year, I you're starting another agency, right? You're not going to quit, Jill. You're at the top of your career. This is, you'd be foolish. And so you really need to know, again, back to who am I and who am I now? So when all those outside voices come of what they think you should do, even well-intentioned, you can stay firm and go, actually, I know where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And I too have made big jumps with pay cuts, just like Lulu and Tanya, because you go for, I'm supposed to be somewhere else. Yeah. Interesting. I want to, I, I think the notion of the success script is really resonating with our audience. Um, I, I want to turn to you guys, to Lulu and Tanya. Does that, does that kind of align with your own experience? Um, your different places in your careers, Lulu, you're nodding S success script playing yeah. in any of that. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm much moved, better. Uh, okay. Great. Thank yeah. You. I just moved to a new apartment last week. We have literally no furniture. So that's probably why it's echoing. It's, it's just been an empty space, but now I'm in a smaller room. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Much better. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So success scripts. Um, I, I think it's a great point. And I think overall success is super personal, right? Like success is how you define, personally define success and how you also personally define success changes over time. It's okay that like your definition of success changes. Like it's so natural for it to change, you know? Um, so it doesn't matter what someone else thinks as long as you're happy and as long as like you're achieving your own goals, whatever they could be, any kind of goals, any kind of success script, I think that is success. Like even right now, um, I'm, I'm always been very ambitious and career driven and now to not have career be part of my identity mm -hmm. as much. Like I didn't know what to put on my LinkedIn bio. Like I was <laughs> like, who am I now that I don't have a title, you know? So uh well, actually, I wanted uh, yeah. to ask you about that, Lulu, because I mean, you on top of that have a bit of this pressure of, you know, you were a 30 under 30 named on the Forbes, you know, one of those big Forbes lists. How does that feel in terms of like, geez, you have done a lot in 10 years, as we just talked about. How does that set you up in terms of thinking about future success? Is it scary or is it empowering? Yeah. I think it's a bit of both, you know, I think in, on the, I mean, I'm, I'm super grateful and I agree with Jealous for sure, team achievement, like, I had an incredible team at, at Lexi that helped us achieve that goal. But um, there, there are like pros and cons. I think like the bright side is like, that's something that I'll always have with me as part of my resume. And I'm proud mm -hmm. of that. Like no one can take that away from me, no matter how long a break I take. So it's nice to have that. Uh, but I think it's also difficult. Like the, the third part is that um, we're talking about success and failure. Um, failure is hard. Failure is always hard. The failure after success is even more hard, you know? And then you have this, uh, people have expectations for you. Um, so there's definitely a lot of pressure, a lot of internal pressure that comes with that. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm still working through because I, I, I want to be able to take risks and I want to not let my fear of failure prevent me from taking risks and doing what I know um, is right for me and right for my life. Um, yeah, I, I think someone, another book, I'm going to mention so many books, but I think another book is, is the top five regrets of the dying. And the number one most common regret yes. of the dying is um, I didn't live a life that was true to myself. It was chasing mm -hmm. someone yeah. else's version. And honestly, that is the biggest failure, you know, like, the, like, it's all about how you define it is, it, um, 
is that so I, it just it's all about being authentic to yourself and how you personally define success and that changes over time yeah that's great thank you for those insights and tanya i just want to shift the conversation away like so we've talked about lulu achieving and achieving like amazing things by 30 <laughs> I, I still think about the kind of ageism that women um have to deal with and that sort of this idea that we have to accomplish everything by a certain time and i don't know if this plays into the work you did in catalyst or the work you're doing now but that we are supposed to have accomplished a certain amount by a certain time in order to be successful and if we don't you know we didn't make the forbes 30 under 30 list what does that no, i didn't uh what does that mean for us and for our futures do men contend with this kind of messaging the same way because they seem to stride and stride until they're you know, running companies or running for president at, you know, whatever advanced age. Um, could you could you reflect on that for us? It's funny, Meredith, you're asking me this question because today's my birthday and I feel like oh, oh, why is okay. why on the panel is she asking me about ageism? Well no. because, <laughs> I'm just giving you because of that. your experience, but no, I know I'm here. I'm getting audience is now <clears throat> singing happy birthday to <clears throat> you. There we go. Look so, at that. Um, coming alive. Happy birthday. We're getting in the chat. So a couple of reflections, one on, on, um, just to build on what Lulu was saying, I, I, I one, if there, I know you're going to ask us kind of for what our one bit of advice is, but certainly one thing that I hope people will take away from our conversation today is that your career is, is, and Jill, you alluded to this, it, it's a bunch of it phases and your life will change and you'll have different factors coming in and out of your life at different times. And so you will need to adjust and to pivot. So to have a single version of success is don't do that. You know, uh, have a version of success that allows you to adapt. It allows you to take risks. It allows you to do some scary things. It allows you maybe to pull back at different times because that is how the life is going to throw you those curveballs and and success will be defined by your ability to adapt to those things. So then if I, if into your ageism question, I do think ageism is real and it is certainly not entirely gendered. It, regardless of your gender, you will start to face ageism, particularly in the more traditional workplace. Uh, we see ageism hit women more significantly at a younger age. If we all recall the COVID Lisa Laflamme not, not coloring her hair situation, um, that is just one example of people expecting that as soon as women start to show their age, you know, men can have gray hair and look distinguished. Women can have gray hair and look old. We, but I, I will, I will assert, and that is something we need to deal with. So I am glad we are having conversations around menopause. I am glad we are having conversations around ageism. I am glad that Dove is doing a campaign around gray hair. Those are all things we need to do. But the other thing we need to remember is that we have gendered all of these things and we can therefore ungender them. Those are social constructs. And so, um, that is up to us to change. And I hope that we collectively as a society and, and as women and as men, as a, anyone who identifies by any gender, we can do. The other thing I would like to just do a little shout out to, because I see that our wonderful Dean Wanda Costin is on, on the webinar and in the chat, is I, I think that she is helping us and uh, the next group of graduates coming out of university and successive groups of graduates to think more broadly about their careers, their career choices, success, and in particular, how they can contribute to the world. And I think someone said this to me the other day, many of you may have heard it. When you think about your career, think about it along the lines of the three Ps, people, puzzle, purpose. And you can define those three things, that th those are very individual in terms of how you define them, but people, pretty obvious. And again, we will all figure out um, what that means in terms of the people we want to work with. Purpose, for some people that could be being CEO of P&G, for example, for other people that could mean really, you know, tackling the climate crisis, and we can insert many other examples. And then puzzle, 
you know, wh what is the strategic issue or the problem that you're trying to solve? And, and I thought, I think that's a really interesting way to think about your career. And it's also a very adaptable, flexible set of lenses that you can apply as you go through these career phases. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Just a, I'll put a book in the chat. There's a great book called Wisdom at Work by Chip Conley, who I'm an I'm an advisor to. He's the founder of Modern Elder Academy. It's a fantastic book. He, he, he was a successful hotelier, retired at 52, and then got a call from the founders of Airbnb and said, I know I, we're tech startup guys. We don't know anything about hoteling, but can you mentor us? And in his work for seven years, mentoring them night and day to build Airbnb, he realized because he was twice the age of everybody. And what you said, Tanya, really struck me. He's, he's like, they didn't need my knowledge about hotels because Airbnb isn't actually a hotel, but they needed my wisdom. And what I had in my 30 some odd years, what he said of, of working was, they needed to, how to build strong teams, how to run a successful meeting, how to, um, uh, like all, all the things of building a company about, about systemized things, it, it, the things that 20 year olds may not know yet, but they could, could be rocket fuel. So I'm going to put that chat in. Oh, someone just put it in there. Perfect. Wisdom <laughs> at work. And it talks all about when you're in your late forties, fifties and sixties, how you can rewire yourself. So you know how to go and, and be a mentor actively and prevent, bring your value. Cause some of it is we need to realize how much knowledge we have. Mm. and not take it for granted and how to package it so you made me think of that and it's in the chat it's a great book well thank you thank you for sharing that um i noticed there's a lot of a uh, lot of questioning in both the chat and the q a around the concept of integrating motherhood i don't think we can really talk about success being women lulu i feel like i keep mm -hmm. not going back to you because i know you're very young still i want to <laughs> So the concept, can we just briefly, Tanya and Jill, I know you are both mothers as well as being very successful career people. Um, just briefly, what's that challenge been like uh, parenting? I know your, your children are grown in both cases, but, but parenting and growing careers at the same time, high level, biggest challenges you've dealt with. How yeah. you it, it, It's incredible challenge because, well, because you get stretched and, it, and parenting, it's hard regardless of you work or you don't work. I'm oh, sorry, work in the home, out of the home. It's really hard. You, you can pour your heart and soul into it and you can always wonder if you did some more. So I have one daughter, she's 20, she's at third year university. It takes a village is what I, my headline would be. But for women, it takes even more of a village. I'd say that because we are often the primary parent both in who the child, it's not always, but often the child's like, when they really are in crisis, mom, that's who they go to first. The second one, so outwardly, also the mental load is usually ours. So even when we look like we're doing nothing, we're like, okay, do they have enough clothes for the fall? Do they have stomach cancer? Do they have the homework? Okay, we're doing that. And that typically is the mother's role as well. And so we have all of that, on top of these big jobs. And typically we're competing with men that don't have the mental load. And they might think they're the primary parent, but most times it's us. So it's challenged. I, I, I have a village and I had a village. So I live on the same street as one of my brothers and his wife was a tremendous help. Uh, Tanya, her name's Tanya, it may help. Her dad lives on the same street. I very deliberately, when I got divorced, moved on the same street where houses apart by design. I had the same caregiver for 12 years. And I, I let people know, I need help. And when they forgot, I said again, I need help. I might look like I'm doing this all. I'm crushing this, this month, this week, or I've got a deliverable. My parents are incredibly close to my daughter. And I let them know, like, I really, I'm gonna get teary thinking of it. It, yeah, someone said it takes a galaxy. It, it, it takes a galaxy, but a child can never be loved too much. So open it up, let love in, but tell people I need help. And then try your best to let go of that guilt of, could I do more? I use technology too, since my daughter was two and three, we've been FaceTiming and I need to know that that's okay with her too. But when you're with them, you be present. You put that phone down and you're better to spend 10 minutes with them 
uninterrupted. Shonda Rhimes says this in her book, A Year to Yes. She goes, they don't really want you for half an hour. They want to play Barbies with you for 15 minutes. And then they realize you're actually not that fun to play Barbies with, but they had you for the first bit. So, <laughs> so put it down, give it your all for a bit, and then come back. But it takes a galaxy. I will pull that from the, the chat. Yeah, I just want to make sure the audience knows that you had a three-year-old when you started your company and you were on your yes. own. Yeah, just so yes. so we set the stage here. I mean, why you needed yes. support and you got support, which is yeah. really- it was and, really, and it was not easy. It was not, it, it, even with the galaxy, it was really hard. Yeah. And, and, Tanya, and there's no, it, it just uh, oh, lots sorry. of help. Yeah. Lots of help. Yeah. You're fortunate you had that. And Tanya, what, do you want to add anything to that? I, uh, very little. First of all, my daughter, one of my kids is on the webinar, so I have to be careful what I say. Um, I, 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 a little bit of a different time. I agree with everything Jill just said. Um, a, two things I will say. One is um, if I look at my life experience in terms of being fortunate enough to be able to mix family with my professional life, and I compare that to some of the women that I know that elected to um, quit work uh, because they were either by choice or by necessity, the very obvious um, caregiver, I um, I am so thankful I stayed in the workforce uh, because it there are tremendous dividends that it pays all the way through and there are tremendous dividends that it pays once your children start to launch and they start to become adults and they are you know they're into their own lives so I um, I would really encourage you as Jill said you know create a network of support around you in whatever shape or form that that takes. Um, and uh, do everything you can to stick with it because it will pay dividends at the end. Um, the other thing I will say is that for me, I did have a, a really at the rock face moment where I, when I was up for partnership in professional services, I was challenged by my firm where they pulled me aside and said, we're not sure you can cut it because you've got kids at home. And I was up uh, for partnership at the same time as a male colleague. I have two kids. He has three kids. Nobody had that conversation with him. They were only having that conversation with me. And um, that was a real turning point for me. Like, what's going on here? And uh, so, th so these things still do exist in the workplace, which is why I now do the work that I do to make sure that we are breaking down this notion that parenting is only one gender's responsibility, right? Like how we ever came up with that, I don't know, because that's not how the biology works. So, um, so we need to change that and continue to change that in the workplace. Right. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention, I don't have kids. And so, so it's, it's a very interesting navigating the world, not having children in a, in a world where the success scripts very often are about having children. So I do want to acknowledge for those of us in the audience who don't have children, whether by choice or not, that that's also a, a, a valid way to be in the world. <laughs> Um, oh, can, can I just oh, yeah. say something to that, Meredith? Because I think yeah. that's so true. Again, it's entirely, um, you are going to define success for yourself and it absolutely may or may not include having kids. Here's the real rub for women who don't have kids. They can still be slammed with the motherhood penalty because <laughs> okay. even though you choose not to have kids, you are a potential vessel for children. And so we need to be on the watch out for that. And so it like <laughs> that, that is like the, the double, triple, quadruple penalty, right? right. So another reason yeah. why we need to be eradicating these things from our, from our narrative, because they're just, they just don't work for anybody. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Lulu, I'm, I haven't been meaning to leave you out. I, I, but I know that this is a, a, a consideration for you. I mean, you've, you've built companies by working long and hard. And now you're at this stage in your life. I know you mentioned to me already that you were sort of thinking about what what the next steps might be and, and thinking about parenthood. And if that's the right um, choice for you, somebody asked, you know, what are the things you have to think about as you think about what to do next and factor in that notion of adding a, a, the title of parent to to your already heavy <laughs> load of accomplishments. Yeah, I know this is super helpful. I'm I'm really enjoying the conversation. This is like good coaching from like Jill and Tanya for me personally. <laughs> I have so many questions. You know, I feel like every question could be its, be its own like one hour seminar, but just on 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 motherhood and on careers because that has been one of my fears about 
and why I've delayed parenting so far is because like, I, I think it's hard to like do everything at once, you know, like there, there are going to be ebbs and flows in your life and like your priorities are going to change. There are different chapters and different seasons and I'm accepting that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for how I'm preparing for it. Um, I, I'm a bit nervous, honestly. I don't, and I think it's an experience that you don't know what it's going to be like until you go through it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I could say what I want now, but I, you know, it could be totally different if I'm in that situation, but it's a conversation that I've had a lot with my husband on like, you know, if we should and when we should and uh, very top of mind right now. So this is all very helpful. And I, I think it's good to see that like, you know, careers are long and, there are different chapters in your life and, you know, you can do it all, but not at the same time. And, you know, like, um, uh, having the help and the, 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 yeah, it's yeah. great too. So, but it's nerve wracking. I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah. And, and I got to, I just got to want to shout out to, to the chat, the people in the chat. I mean, there've been some really great observations there around how women without children are sometimes penalized and expected to take on a larger load because they don't have kids or those who do have kids who are also penalized for having kids, for being pregnant, for uh, trying to people trying to hide pregnancies lest they be penalized. It is astonishing the lived experiences we've had, whether we have children or not, whether we plan to have them or don't have them. Um, that that really <laughs> factors into all of our lives. It's quite amazing. So thank you, audience, for being so engaged. Um, I want to get to some of the audience questions because there are some really great ones um, coming in. Uh, this is back to the question of success. Um, Bindu Thomas asks, at a time when social media is so powerful and all we see on LinkedIn are success stories, do you have any advice on how to navigate the internal dissonance that causes? Um, and I think that's an interesting question because because it's true, the self-promotion world that we live in, where we're all supposed to be doing more and better and often and promoting it and, and really uh, selling our own brand all the time, it's an exhausting way to live, but it seems we're being told it's kind of the only way to live or to get ahead. Um, does anybody want to wanna take a stab at that one for Bindu? Yeah. Sure. Jill? sure. I, I think living a life with purpose is I think what we're all seeking is to have meaning and I throw my back into something and I lose myself in flow like we all know when we're in flow we go like where did they go and oh my god I don't even feel I can't believe I get to get paid for doing this we know what that feels like and whether it's a job or a hobby but what I encourage people to do is not to look at P purpose with a capital P, but what if we shrink it to small, a portfolio of purposes, small letter P. And then we have subjects. You know, if you think of Arthur Brooks latest work on about happiness with Oprah, you know, he scientifically says there's four buckets towards feeling a sense of happiness and it's meaningful work. Yes, but it's three others family so what's my purpose with my family with my daughter now that she's 20 my success script is how do I help her be an adult and how do I parent her like an adult and I keep a very strong tether but the tether is as, as a 20 year old fully functioning very capable young woman so I have to change the way I parent and I get great fulfillment out of watching myself adjust to her and then so it's family friends who are your three friends you can call in the middle of the night and would call you without judgment? Most of us have deal friends. We don't have real friends, especially true for men. My partner goes golfing and I'm like, oh, you, how, he goes, I don't even know if they're married. Jill and I, I don't, I don't even get to that part. We've been golfing for five years together. We just don't talk about it. You know? And so friends, you want to have three. three. So who are you keeping in touch with? Who are you texting? I will text them every day. I will tell them I'm thinking of them every day. I might get together once a month because I'm busy. Friends, perspective is the other one. Faith, you might call it. Am I taking time for something that's bigger than myself? It might be for some people, it might be getting out in nature. For some people, it might be church. For some people, it might be spirituality. Get in, spend time with something bigger than yourself to shrink yourself and to lose point, shrink your ego. And then yes, meaningful work. But when you shrink that down to small peas, you might go, oh, my community means a lot to me. I'm going to shop local. I will look the barista in the eyes. I will go to the, my flower guy's name is Andy. 
Um, the card shop I buy, it's Sharon, she owns it. And I make a very deliberate, and now all of a sudden now I feel purposeful because purpose is a verb. And I think that's another way of looking at what am I supposed to do and am I on track and what are my success scripts is shrink the whole thing down. So you're not, you're saying that every time you go to the flower shop, you don't take a perfect selfie with a bundle of flowers, post it on Instagram, <laughs> make sure we know that you are buying flowers today really beautifully and, and, and that your life is amazing and perfect and beautiful all the time. But even if you do do that, as long as, if it really is true, then it's true. No, it just means, posting there's, some, it. Yeah. there's some questions about say, the pressure, that pressure. Yeah, just, yeah. just to add to that. Oh, pressure. Um, I think it's a good question. I think not most importantly number one social media is not reality 100 percent, it is not reality you know i'm friends with influencers yeah. um and I, I know what goes on behind the scenes and like people are putting up a, a front for sure i think it's people are actually being more vulnerable on social media than they used to uh, but for example my friend posted a photo of me a story like last year I was like smiling and happy but I was having a mental breakdown and like sobbing like behind the scenes you know about something else so I think mm -hmm. it's just it's not reality so you cannot compare yeah. your life to someone's highlight reel and like you know we go on social media when we're bored and we see people do all these like exciting things but yeah it's not reality um, and I think too having some offline time I find is super rejuvenating if you're always on always on media um, it, it's it really clutters your head so I, I try to be offline every Saturday and take a break from social and media in general um offline time I think is just super important Lulu you um, actually are quite disciplined about this offline business so it's not just Saturdays yes. right? you have an evening routine which is also really disciplined yeah yeah what? like every every night at 11 p.m I, I shut off, off everything and then I have time to unwind so I get a good night's sleep which is really important like for me for a while getting a good night's sleep was my definition of success you know so uh, and I think like I sometimes like during that time I watch shows of people's lives who go through really hard things you know like um, there's a lot going on in the world right now that's like super difficult and like actually like every time I see anything like that I'm, I'm always so grateful for the life that I get to live and the problems that I get to have and the problems that I, I have the privilege of solving because, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, there's just much harder things out there in the world. So I think having that perspective helps versus social media is just like a highlight reel, mainly. No, that's really important. Thank you for saying that. Tanya, did you want to jump in on, on anything you heard? I only follow dogs on social media. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Advice and even top. sometimes those videos are not real, but I'm okay with that. But only dogs, period. Okay. Only dogs. That is your advice. Um, I want to go back to the habits thing for a second, because one thing I would say, um, you guys are, are have been very good about um, set goal setting and habit forming. Lulu, you started a whole company around doing this sort of thing with your habit journals. Can we just briefly, in terms of sort of a, a, just a few seconds, a few minutes of advice for people around the tricks and tips that you have around um, setting goals, charting your path, knowing what you want to do. Lulu, why don't you kick us off? You were the queen. Yeah. Of <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's very important. Habits are the fundamental cornerstones of success we don't rise to the level of our goals we fall to the level of our systems and our habits um so uh, for sure it's important to have healthy ones um and for me like a big part of a big habit for me is journaling and having that time for reflection having a reset having goal setting so i do that on a daily weekly monthly quarterly annual three-year basis i have a system for uh, all of those things but I think like just I mean just one piece of advice is just to write down what goals I think everyone should do that it could be a simple list and just by writing it down it increases your chance of achieving them by 42 percent so um, having some kind of reflection reset goal setting process for yourself whatever works for you I think it, it's good to find that that helps me get recentered like on a consistent routine because these are my systems that help me like, you know, manage the goals I have in my life. So you're literally journaling every day or are you doing a sort of weekly reflection or monthly reflection? How do you, how does it yeah. work? For me, personally, I journal every day. Okay. I've been journal journaling every day for the last eight years. 
um, and it's a nice unload. So, uh, and it, I get to like read my journal entry from a year ago today, like one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and so on. So it's nice to see like where where I've come. Um, but yeah, also like planning my week. Um, and most, I would say one of the most impactful things I do with journaling is I, I set a three-year vision. Like it's another book called Vivid Vision by Cameron Harrell. Vivid um, Vision. Okay. We all have to yeah. put the, in the, in the email after. Do that, do that for your personal life and also for your business. It's really important to like know where you want to go so that you can live your life intentionally. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, Jill, you've talked about a double notebook system to me. Do you want to briefly introduce the double notebook system? These might be helpful for people as they, as they yeah. track. This is the one thing I tell all my clients is, um, so this notebook, my black notebooks are my to-do. This is my work and it's everything's in here. But I always have a second notebook. Um, and my colored notebooks are my wisdom journals. And this goes with me everywhere. My staff knows it. My It goes in my purse. You can pick it any size. But this is where I write things like, I love today. I was in flow. What was I doing? I lost track of time. Another one might be, this person triggers me. I always get prickly when they're in. Why does this person trigger me? I wonder where the beginning is. Oh, that's a really good quote. I'm going to write that down. Oh, that book you said. Okay, I'm going to write that. Because then it's all in here. And in that sense of who am I now, this is where I journal. So it's a, it's a bit of Lulu's. And then I also, because I carry it with me everywhere, I, I take things out of meetings. Like, oh, that person held themselves really well in this meeting. Why do I like that? Oh, I like the way they sat. Or I like the way that they have a power outfit on, but it wasn't overpowering. I still focused on them. Okay. And all of that's in here. And you don't write very much. You might write half a page here or two sentences there or a full page the other day. I have 11 in my 30 years. When I was told to do the uh, 27 years, I was told do. You don't have that much in here. But then you can curl up at night or whatever. And I look through and go, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that. Or to Lulu's point, you can go back a year and go, oh, I've conquered that. that that's helpful. So I get, do whatever system you want, but keep a second notebook because this stuff will get buried into this stuff and you'll never see it again. Yeah, great advice. Tanya, do you have a system? Do you have a, how do you set your goals? How do you know what you're doing next? So I feel like all these things I should have been doing that Lulu and Jill are talking <laughs> yeah. about. Uh, I mean, at work, I do write everything down. I'm, pre I'm pretty structured. Um, and it, to take Jill's example, I just use technology to do the black book and the green book. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the growth ideas, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, a la growth mindset? And then what are just the things I need to get done? I, I will say for me personally, one of the things I think that has... Um, probably on some days saved me and on other days really propelled me is I am religious about getting exercise and I do it at 5 a.m. And when my kids were young, they were early risers. So I did it at 4.30 a.m., which I know sounds gross to most. And it's funny, some people used to say to me, you know, Tanya, you're so lucky that you uh, are able to like just to wake up in the morning. And, and I don't think it's luck. I think it's habit sort to what Lulu was saying. Like, I, I think he just, yeah. I mean, I'm not a barrel of laughs at 11 PM. Um, so I just have to time shift my day, but that is sort of a structure that uh, again, I, I would truly say has saved me at times because that is my time to contemplate or to blow off steam or to just listen to music that I like. And um, it gives you a, I shouldn't say you, me, a refreshed perspective on the day. Right. Great. That's such great advice. Exercises, everything. Uh, someone says 5 a.m. CrossFit five times a week in the chat. So you do have your exercise fans, early exercise fans. Um, we have so many great questions in the in the chat. We're not going to get to all of them. I, I want to pull in a couple that I can't resist. Um, from Sarah Cowell, how can women develop their leadership skills without being taken advantage of due to their proficiency in multitasking and carrying mm -hmm. mental loads in the workplace? We talked about the mental loads 
that you carry as mothers, which is of course the invisible work of parenting. Um, how does this translate to the to the workplace and and the fact that women are so good at carrying mental loads? Um, can do, I can I take that one? Yeah, please, Tanya, do. I think there it's really important as um, all of us, but this does tend to fall a little bit more to women. <clears throat> Very quickly in your organization, figure out what is promotable and what is non-promotable work. There are a lot of extra projects and tasks that you can take on in an organization. Some of them are, you know, doing a strategic project that is going to get you uh, visibility with more senior leaders. Some of it is loading the dishwasher properly at the end of the day. <laughs> figure out what is promotable and non-promotable work. Sometimes you'll take on non-promotable work, which might be for example, organizing a holiday party for the office. That's great. Do that once. Don't be the person that does that every year. Uh, really figure that out and create the right balance because loading the dishwasher is not going to position you for career growth, development, and satisfaction. That would be my advice on that. You're here. Um, in fact, Can I add questions around boundaries, I that. the boundary around the dishwasher. Lulu, yes. Yes. I just have four words to add to that. Uh, but it's been helpful for me and it's a very uh, quick uh, trick. Uh, but my friend has this slogan called what would Chad do? Um, what would Chad so do? Has, like, what would Chad do? Like she has just like a big bracelet you're just always thinking about. But if I'm ever like holding myself back or like some kind of imposter syndrome or I'm stuck about something, I, I would think that. And that that's a helpful thing for me yeah. to get some perspective. Chad yeah. is not loading the dishwasher, I think. No. Yeah. <laughs> And there was a question in the chat about your journals, Lulu, but somebody's answered it for you. The Habit Journal and the company is Evergreen Journals, right? We can, everyone can yes. Google and find Lulu's journal. And there will be some amazing habit forming possibilities in her journals. Um, all right. We are nearing the end of the time we have together, which is a shame because there's so much more we could talk about. Lulu, this is the first time I heard the word imposter syndrome in our whole hour. And we could go <laughs> a question on imposter syndrome. Um, I do want to take the last few minutes to say, and I asked this question last year as our last question for International Women's Day, but if you could go back and give some advice to your younger self, I know it seems like an obvious question, but it's such an insightful one, given where you have all um, moved to in your careers at this stage. What advice would you give your younger self? Who wants to start? I can start. Um, Ooh. Yeah, I, I have three pieces of advice. And I think I, I follow this a little bit in my uh, 20s, but I think it's just good advice for my younger self. One is to follow your intuition, not your ego. I'm going to repeat what I said at the beginning of the conversation because it's so important. All the best decisions I've made in my career and my life have been intuitive. All the worst decisions have been ego. So follow your, your intuition, not your ego. Two, find a role model. It doesn't have to be someone you know, but like it could be someone on the internet. For me, it was these two influencers. I watched their YouTube video on the internet and I was very inspired by their lifestyle. Um, and yeah, it could be anyone. Um, and just get exposed to like different lifestyles, different possibilities, different like path. You don't even know what you can achieve until like someone else has um, paid that path for you. Um, so, and then get their playbook. And then the third thing is to just to execute against that, you know, always be learning. Um, I really enjoy my morning hour is always like a walk and a podcast and a book, an audible book or a podcast. So yeah, those are the three things. Follow your intuition, find a role model, and then be a constant learner. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Jill? I'd say three things as well, I'll follow the three, Lily. Um, one is know who you are. I, I said that before and I'll pull back to the beginning. I wish I knew as my younger self, know who are you and constantly keep asking yourself, who am I now? And I'm gonna put in the chat, is a really great exercise from Brene Brown. If you're watching this recording, you don't have the chat, it's Google Brene Brown, living into your values. It's an excellent exercise. I take all my clients through it. Who are you now? What are the two values that are your core truth? And they will probably be unique to you. That's number one. Number two is find mentors to Lulu's point. And it don't need to be where you are. Just go, I like, and, and they're, they're usually not for everything. I like the way that person presents. I like that way that person looks at innovation. I like that way that person presents themselves. I like the way that person seems to juggle X, Y, Z. Find them and just get close to them. Or to Lulu's point, 
follow them, but but rarely is one mentor enough. Get your suite, know what you're following them for. The third is take up space. Take your space, stand square. Erase that early script we probably were all born with, which was be nice, be sweet. Yeah. Step back, hold back, take up your space, learn that early, sit at the table. How many women I've had to coach going, why are you sitting in the chair or sitting on top of the air conditioner? It was not enough room for everyone. Take the chair, get up there, let him sit back there. It happens all the time. Stand square, do the Ann Cuddy power pose if you need to, <laughs> but take up not too much space, take up your space. That's what I would tell my. We're getting it. We're getting Astrid in the chat saying "women splain and women spread." There we go. <laughs> All right, inspiring words. And Tanya, how about you? For me, it is that life, and as part of that, your professional career is a marathon, not a sprint. And we need to stop thinking about it as a sprint. It is not that. It is truly, it is, there will be a story arc here, or there may be three or four or five story arcs here. And think about it. You do not need to achieve all the things in the first decade. You may be really happily surprised by how things play out. But give it a chance to be a marathon because that's truly what it is designed to be. Wonderful. We've got it. We're getting a lot of yes, success is fluid. <clears throat> all right. Well, I am getting the chat you'll see is lit up with women who are very, very grateful for all of your amazing experience and insights. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we wrap things up, as I always do, I'm going to do my little plug for all the learning opportunities we have at Smith and Queens. Um, if you're looking to boost your own prospects audience, I do want you to consider uh, the learning opportunities through Queen's Executive Education. So we've got lots of sessions coming up in the next few months, both uh, virtual and in person. Some of these are in Toronto. And um, you can visit smithqueens.com slash execed for a full lineup of courses. And finally, we're going to be bringing you another free Smith Business Insight webinar next month. Uh, coming up on uh, Thursday, April the 11th, you can join us to learn more about how AI can make you a better business leader. That session is going to be led by Dagmar Christensen, who is a Smith alumna working in the intersection between AI and HR. So that should be really interesting. Keep your eyes on your inbox for more information about that session. Um, can I get our panelists back on? Can we dash this slide away and bring our panelists back? Just to say, here we are. So thank you, um, Tanya, Jill, Lulu. I am so grateful for your participation today. Um, and the audience is very grateful as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, happy International Women's Day to everybody. I hope, uh, I hope you feel as inspired as I do going back out into the world. And I wish you all a really wonderful rest of the day. Bye. Thank you, Meredith. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.